Hello YouTube, today I'll be addressing Hank's arguments against intelligent design. Of course, these arguments might, may not be made by him specifically, but we're still going to address them. It seems like Hank sees these arguments as being favorable or, or better explanations for why the world has intelligence, reason, and logic. Well, elements of the natural world operate according to complex laws that sustain a beautiful natural harmony. Paley said that this couldn't possibly just have happened any more than the design of a pocket watch could just have happened. There must be a designer. If you accept this analogy, then you agree with Paley that just like the purposefulness of a watch compels us to believe in a watchmaker, the purposefulness of the world compels us to believe in a world maker, God. And you might think this is a fantastic argument. It might even be what motivates your own belief in God. There are lots of people who say things like sunsets and babies show them that there must be a designer god but some of you probably aren't buying it and you know what to do arguments are refuted by counter arguments no duh hank give us a little credit here guy so when you want to refute an argument by analogy, you offer a disanalogy. Basically, you demonstrate that situation A and situation B are dissimilar enough that the analogy doesn't actually work. So to object to Paley, we have to identify a way in which elements of the natural world, like human bodies, are relevantly dissimilar to watches. When we're talking about a watch, an objector might say, it obviously had a creator. After all, we can take it apart and see clearly how the gears fit together and move the hands and keep time. But there's so much... You could take that apart you could take a watch apart and see how the inner workings of the watch work but if you hand that watch to let's say a tribal man or let's say to someone who just simply isn't familiar with the inner workings of a watch they wouldn't understand why the watch ticks the way it does or why everything in it works the way it does in the natural world that isn't understandable in the same you say that you say that there's so much in the natural world that isn't understandable in the same way. Well, in this circumstance, you would be the tribal man who simply doesn't understand why it works the way it does. However, it's the other way around. We understand so much more about our biology and the reasons why it works the way it does than what we don't understand. In fact, science just, just science itself just recently discovered the purpose for the so-called junk DNA, which was pr previously thought to have no purpose, when in fact its purpose is crucial to our biological makeup. And I'll let Richard Dawkins explain that at the end of this video, just in case your bias gets the better of you. Way. For instance, why would God have designed our eyes to have a blind spot? Haley you ask why we have a blind spot. Well, according to Illinois.edu, all the information that the retina picks up is sent to the brain through the optic nerve. The only, the only problem is that the optic nerve needs a way to get out of the eye. The place where it leaves the eye is the so-called blind spot. However, if you have both eyes open, it, it rids us of the blind spot. So unless you're driving or walking with one eye open, you won't have anything to worry about. However, I don't recall the Bible saying anything about this world being perfectly made. Furthermore, in another video, you praise the sight of the octopus because they do not have a so-called blind spot. However, the octopus can't see in color, and can you really compare the eye, or can you really compare our eyesight with the eyesight of another animal? It is because of the way we see that we are able to develop the way we have been as the human species responded that it doesn't matter whether we can understand how something was created. The point is simply that it was. He might point out, for instance, that I actually don't understand the inner workings of my phone, but I still know it had a creator. Whether or not I understand how it was created is beside the point. Next objection, some parts of nature... If it's beside the point, then why bring it up, Hank? seem to be without purpose. A blind spot obviously doesn't have any function, and neither do nipples on a man. Paley's nipples on a man. Well, our natural surrounding reveals a self-sustainable world, and in order to be self-sustainable, the world needs to be the world needs to work in a certain way that is consistent. The only reason why men have nipples is due to this need for self for self sustainability. For example, our su our survival was largely dependent on breastfeeding, so the nipple carrying gene is strong in our biological makeup. Therefore, we bear the effects of this strong gene. As males, we carry feminine genes in order to pass those genes to our offspring. In fact, males are the ones who determine the sex of their offspring. So we need this gene to even to to give it to our daughters pretty much is what I'm trying to say. Other animals aren't as reliant on breastfeeding and so they escape this natural effect. So by both men and women having nipples, we are able to see that men and women are one. And just like men, a woman is attracted to their counterpart's body including their nipples. 
response here was, just because you don't know there's a purpose doesn't mean there isn't one. But this is a problem too, because his whole argument for believing in God is that you should look at the world and see purpose. So if we see some things in the world that are working great... And really no, his argument isn't that we should look at the world and see purpose, it's that there is purpose whether or not we realize it seem to have complexity and definite use and others that don't, that's a flaw in his argument. What's more, the absence of any obvious purpose in things can lead people to start searching for purposes, effectively making them up. For instance, I could find a purpose for this finger. I could use it as a nose picker. It would make a good one. It's just the right size to really get in there and dig around. But was my finger designed to pick noses? Your finger was designed with multiple purposes in mind, one of which is to help you clean your nose. I think a distinction can be clearly made between scientific and objective purposes and biased opinionated purpose purposes which are defined by our desires and wants. For example, I could want a falling star to be a sign of something more symbolic. However, I cannot not want that star to be an asteroid that has decreased in speed due to entering the Earth's atmosphere. It's your kind of thinking that leads people to believe that they can actually change their sex. Probably not. 20th century British philosopher Bertrand Russell made fun of this purpose-finding tendency by pointing out that you could look at a bunny and form the belief that God gave it a fuzzy white tail so hunters would have something to shoot at. The point is, if we're the ones inventing purposes rather than recognizing ones that are inherently there, then we're the real creators of purpose in the... No, Hank, that's exactly what you are doing by asking why our eyesight isn't better than it already is. You can, for example, ask why the human... I can't see as far as an eagle's or why I can't see in the dark. Heck, you could ask why we can't run as fast as a cheetah or fly like a bird. Your assertions do not disprove intelligent design. It just shows that we aren't perfect according to your personal standards. And I don't remember the Bible saying anything about this world being perfect world, not God. Basically, if you believe that God made eyes for seeing, then you also have to believe that he designed fingers as nose pickers and rabbit tails as bullseyes and blind spots as ways for us to get into the car accidents. So Unless you're driving with one eye open, you won't have a problem with your blind spot. However, there is the car's blind spot, which is something completely different. Unless we can see 360 degrees around our heads, it will always be a problem. However, the human's eye was designed to be forward-looking for really, for really great purposes. One reason is to help us maintain a great level of concentration. If it wasn't for our forward-looking viewpoint, we wouldn't be as, in as intellectual as we are today. However, a better question to ask is why... It, a better question to ask whether is we, is, as, as whether or not humans were made to drive cars. According to all academia, the human's biology was not made to drive cars. It is very unnatural and it's the main reason why so many accidents happen to begin with. And there you go again, there, and there you go again, Hank. You're mixing scientific objective purposes with subjective opinions. The counter argument here is we don't just get to pick and choose and say God designed the stuff we want him to have designed and not the other stuff. Rather than searching for disanalogies, another way Paley's argument has been countered is with an alternative explanation for condition B. Paley says that bodies are purposeful and from there concludes that the purpose had to have been put there by an intelligent creator. But another explanation for how bodies came to have the complexity and functionality they have today is natural selection and random mutation. We can conceive that the existence... So let's be honest guys, has Hank provided an argument that outweighs the argument of intelligent design? I think the obvious answer is no, but Hank is rather biased in his assertions. Now let's take a look at what Richard Dawkins has to say about intelligent design. So I really, I found this really cool video, um, and it compiles a lot of videos of Richard Dawkins talking about intelligent design, and what we see in biology. details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. I suppose it would have to be the double helix, uh, the Watson and Crick 
discovery of the structure of DNA, which is far more, was far more than just the discovery, the crystallographic um, work, di discovering the structure of, of a big molecule. Because what they, what that led up to, was a major revolution in which much of biology became a sort of branch of information technology. Um, the consequence of the Watson Crick <coughs> discovery, with all that it led on to, with the, the DNA code and the sort of um, uh, various genome projects that are going on now, is that genes, which from my point of view are absolutely central to biology, genes are information. They are coded information. It even looks like computer information. I mean, a, a, a chromosome is, is a great long computer. I find that very interesting given that many of my um, critics say that DNA does not have information, that it does not, is, is not coded. And here you have Richard Dawkins saying the complete opposite. Tape is linear, it runs one, one dimensional digital code. Um, it's not binary, it's quaternary, but apart from that, it's, it's just the same as, as computer tape. It's, it's read in, in sequence, um, it's copied and pasted from one part of the organism to another in just the same way as, as a computer programmer would cop copy and paste. Um, so biology has turned into, into computer science. Um, whereas we thought that only a minority of the, the genome was doing something, namely that minority which actually codes for protein. Um, uh, and, and now we find that, uh, that actually the majority of it's doing something. What it's doing is calling into, into action the protein coding genes. So you could think of the protein coding genes as being the sort of toolbox of subroutines, which is pretty much common to all mammals. I mean, all mice and men have the same number, roughly speaking, of protein coding genes, and that's always been a, a bit of a blow to the self-esteem of humanity. But what the point is, that that was just the subroutines that are called into being. The program that's calling them into action is, is the... Is the the rest, which had previously been written off as junk. You see, um, even today you have many atheists claiming that uh, our DNA, uh, most of it, is, is considered junk. And here you have Dart Dawkins himself saying that we've learned that it, it isn't junk, that it does all have a purpose. An individual organism is a throwaway survival machine for the self-replicating coded information which it contains. And the fate of that coded information is crucially bound up with the fate of the body in which it sits. of life, the chemical circumstances that gave rise to the first self-replicating molecule, the first proto-gene. Um, the origin of life is something we don't know anything about, and we want to know something about it, and uh, I would love to know how life actually got started, the origin of the first self-replicating entity. Nobody knows how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. What was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right. How did that happen? I told you we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, no. no, no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. Example of a genetic mutation or, or, or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, evolution is true. Can you just um. stop one <laughs>
And in, in, one in, in one of those videos, you hear Dawkins even playing with the idea that aliens came down to Earth and made the DNA themselves. They, they manipulated our DNA because he, he, he just can't find an explanation for it. So I hope you enjoyed this video, guys, and you have a blessed day.